which is the month he may be found. This is when the king is in the field, right before Rosh Hashanah. He's going through the wheat and the tares. This is a season to call upon God. This is the season he is near. Okay, so the ones that are godly know when he may be found. The, uh, let me look at this. This is why you have to be on God's calendar. This is why we produced last year. This is one of them's last year's calendar. One of them is this year's calendar. So you can know the times and seasons. We combine the biblical calendar with the Gregorian calendar. And this latest one where the heavens declare the glory of God goes all the way to 2026. So you can look and know the times and the seasons when God is near. Look at Proverbs 1, 24 through 31. How many of you, when you call on the Lord, want him to answer you? Anybody? Well, guess what? It's very easy to have that happen. All you have to do is answer when he calls you. If you answer when he calls you, guess what? He'll answer when you call him. Look at Proverbs 1, 24 through 31. Because I've called and you refuse to answer, I stretched out my hand and no one even regarded. You have said at nothing all my counsel. You would have none of my reproof. Therefore, I'm going to laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. When your fear comes as a desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then you will call upon me, but I won't answer. They'll seek me early, but they're not going to find me. Those are scary verses. This tells you, you got to get on God's calendar and you have to answer when he calls. If you want him to answer when you call. Wow. Wow. They'll even seek him early, but won't find me. Did you know Jeremiah was living during the time of the destruction of the temple? Three times God told Jeremiah, don't pray for Israel. Don't pray for Israel. Don't even pray for them. It's, it's like they've gone over the cliff. It's too late. And it, it says here, then shall you call upon me. I will not answer. You'll seek me early. You won't find me. For that they hated knowledge, they did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel, they despised my reproof, therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Wow. But guess what? You see scripture after scripture after scripture that supports this concept. Just like in this morning's Torah portion, a lot of blessings if you obey, a lot of curses if you don't obey. Look at Zechariah 7, which speaks of the last days that we're in. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah, and it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true judgment, show mercy and compassion everyone to his brother. Don't oppress the widow or the fatherless, the stranger nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Now, is that all done away with? I don't think so. But they refused to hearken. They pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the Torah. Oh my gosh. And the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. <sighs> Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it's come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. I scattered them with the whirlwind among all the nations whom they didn't know. Isn't that amazing? We have to understand God has laws and he has justice, but he's also merciful when you fail if your goal is at least to try to keep the law. So here we see now, let's go back to the Song of Songs. Songs, chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Now, if you remember, the watchman of the city, when they first found her, she finally finds her beloved. But this time, the watchman catch her. Now, the other thing about this, I, I'm not sure exactly what the word for watchman is here in this verse, but uh, note three or the note three refers to Christians. And sometimes I almost wonder if this isn't prophetically speaking about 
Christians over the last 2,000 years. It says, the watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. And then it's, he says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, please tell him I'm lovesick. All right. So this time the watchman abuser take away her veil symbolically saying she's no longer committed to anyone. Typically, if the bride was committed to someone, she'd wear a veil and she's not committed. Therefore, they take the veil away from her. And uh, there are some very interesting connections here. Uh, what do we know about the watchman? We, we just read about the watchman. And I always believe to let scripture interpret scripture. I don't want to just tell you what my little fairy tale idea is. Let's look at what the Bible says. Isaiah 56, 10 and 12. His watchmen are blind. I got a nice little picture up here. How would you like to have this person be the watchman? I don't think so. He says they're all, the watchmen are all ignorant. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. How many of you would like this to be your watchdog? It's, it's, no, you don't want a watchdog like that. You know, here it says they, they can't even bark. Yes, they are greedy dogs, which never have enough. And now he says they are shepherds who don't understand they all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain, from his own territory. Come, one says, I will bring wine and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will just be as today and much more abundant. This is much of the church today. They're fast asleep. They don't see the signs of the times. They think we're not supposed to know. And they got their head in the sand. So now, after the Shulamite bride says to the daughters of Jerusalem, and you remember who those are, like the outlying cities, the other people, they say to her, well, what makes your beloved better than any other beloved, oh, fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you are so charging us that we have to go help you find them? And so finally, the Shulamite cries out, from a pure heart of repentance and one of her greatest detailed descriptions, you can really just feel her heart crying. In verse 10 through 16, now this is what we're supposed to be doing. Everyone sees God as Thor, throwing lightning bolts down at the people below. No, we need to describe the Messiah and God like this. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. We're supposed to be telling everyone how wonderful God is, how fantastic he is. Wow, powerful. Now she's talking, and she even declares him as her friend. Well, uh, look at James 2, verse 23. The scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God. It was accounted him for righteousness, and he was called the what? The friend of God. When are we described as, how many of you would like to be like Abraham and be described as a friend of God? How does that happen? John 15, 14, 45. You're my friends if you do what I tell you to do. <laughs> okay. No longer do I call you servants for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things I've heard from my father. I have made known to you. We're friends of God, but we know what's coming. So now, how do the daughters of Jerusalem respond now? Oh my goodness, in chapter six, verse one, where in the world has he gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? So when we tell people how much we love God, that is when the other people want to go seek him with you. 
If all you do is pour condemnation on people and how they're big fat sinners and they're condemned and they're going to hell, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. You need to just tell them how wonderful God is and how you're seeking him and then they'll naturally respond to the gospel. That's how it's supposed to be. Because she now confesses the love she has for her beloved before others, not just keeps it to herself locked in a house, now she goes out and confesses it. Uh, when we realize that our relationship with God is not based on religion, this too will have an effect on the lives of others. Uh, the Jewish people, I believe, will soon return to the Lord, confess their love for him, and it will have a tremendous effect on all the nations. Revival never comes with a seeker-friendly approach. It never does. It's because she now confesses the love she has for her beloved before others. Now they also want to seek him. Um, just as in the Song of Songs, we see that everyone's invited to come and eat. God's call is to those who are thirsty, but we have to seek him when he may be found. And I believe very soon we're going to see all the nations running to the Jewish people when the Jewish people return to the Lord. Look at Romans eleven fifteen. If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what should the receiving of them be but the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, the last days. That's why when Israel returns back to the Lord, then we're going to know that the Messiah is, has opened the door and he's coming in. Where is this event prophesied? Let's look at Zechariah 8, verse 20 and 23. It says, so says the Lord of hosts, there yet will be nations, inhabitants of many cities, and the residents of one will go to another saying, hey, let us go at once to seek favor of the face of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. And many people and strong nations will all come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? Jerusalem. You know, many people don't believe it's the capital of Israel. Well, the time is coming. It's going to be the capital of the whole world. And the Messiah is going to be ruling and reigning. It says, in those days, 10 people out of all languages of the nations will take hold and will seize the skirt of one man, a Jew, and they're saying, we want to go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, I don't know if you guys have done the math. How many of you like math? How many of you hate math? Okay. How many people are going to grab the skirt of the Jew? How many? It, well, let's read it again. In those days, 10 men out of all the languages of the nations will take hold and seize the skirt. So how many? Ten. Wrong. There's 70 nations. That's 10 from each 70. That's 700 people. It's 700 to one. We'll be gathering the skirt. Saying, take us with you up to Jerusalem. Isaiah. 55, verse 1 through 7. It says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. What? I can buy this without money? Yeah, it's pretty much free. Come and buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why in the world are you spending money for what isn't bread and your wages for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear, come to me and hear, and your soul will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I've given David as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you will call a nation you don't know. And look at this. And nations who do not know you are going to run to you. Why? Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. He's glorified you. And again, look what it says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. This is why you got to get on God's calendar so you understand when those times are. Let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man is thought. Let him return to the Lord. The month of Elul is the month of return. And they'll have mercy. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Hosea, again, comes through with a very prophetic insight as to when all of this will happen. We read of how the Lord will tear Judah from the land of Israel. He'll get a hold. Now, I want you to get hold of this, the next thought. The Messiah comes from heaven. He goes away. He returns to his place. And he says he's going to stay there until Israel acknowledges their offense and begin to seek his face. Look at Matthew 23, 28, or 30, 39. The Lord says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I say unto you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Adonai. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, so here the Lord says, I am not going to return until Israel repents. That's what he says. Well, guess what? Oh, look. At Hosea 5, verse 14 through 6, 3. I will be like a lion to Ephraim, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. That's what happened. That's what happened. And he says, no one will be able to rescue them. And then look at what the Messiah says, I will return again to my place. That's heaven. Until they acknowledge their offense. There it is. That's what Matthew was saying. Did they get it from Hosea? The Lord's going to come. He's going to tear here. Uh, Israel was destroyed. They haven't been inhabited or around for 2,000 years. He says, I'm going to go tear. I'm going to go return to my place. And then I'm not going to come back until they, Israel acknowledges what they did. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they'll earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, they will say. He has torn, but he'll heal us. He has stricken us, but he will bind us up. Now look at this. After two days, he will revive us. Two days is how many years? And how many years has it been since Messiah torn them? 2,000 years. And then what happens? All of a sudden, Israel was revived. Israel came back in 1948. And then on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. The Lord rose on the third day. Symbolically, okay, the nation of Israel, all of humanity will rise on the third millennial day, early in the morning like he did. On the first day of the week, boom, the resurrection of the dead takes place. I mean, we are, and I don't know how many of you realize this, what year is this? We're about to enter 5785. We're 5784. Rosh Hashanah is 5785. Now, you have to know math to really get this, but I think you know it anyway. When do you become two years old? On your second birthday. But actually, you're in your second year the day after your first birthday. You following me? You're not two until you've completed everything. Okay, so if we are in the year 5785, which millennial number are we in? When you hit 5,000, that means you've completed 5,000 years. So if you're 5785, you are 785 years into the sixth day. Everyone following me? We are in the sixth day. Now, you might, I might tell people, guess what? We're about to enter the seventh day. Well, what do you mean? We're only five, seven, eight, four. How can you enter the seventh day? Because five, seven, eight, four is the sixth day. You following me? It's 784 years into the sixth day. Now, the day begins at sunset, not sunrise. We are entering the seventh day right now. We are entering the seventh day. 784 years would be equivalent to like eight o'clock at night of the sixth day, that sunset. 
We are entering the seventh day right now. And I know many people believe that when he rose from the dead, some believe it was around sunrise, but no, the stone was rolled away. He was already gone. When did he actually rise from the dead? Many believe it was Saturday night, which is actually when the first day of the week begins. So he rose on the first day, but it was after sunset of the Sabbath. That's why he became the first fruits on the first day of the week. And it very well could have been Saturday night because Saturday night begins the first day. If that's the case, the resurrection of the dead could be happening any day now, any time now. We are at the beginning of the seventh day now. And so it says the third day he will raise us up. That's the third millennial day. He will come to us like what? The rain, like the latter and the former rain, the latter rain and the former rain refers to the spring feast and the fall feast. That's all tied to the feast. Wow. He comes to us like the rains. The spring rains speak of Passover and his first coming. The latter rains speak of the fall feast and his second coming. And we see in the Song of Songs, the two times the shepherd appears have to do with the spring and the fall feast. The first time he comes, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. That's his first coming. We are now in the Song of Songs prophetically talking about his second coming during the fall feast. And in a week, we're going to be entering the fall feast. We need to be alert. With that, let's stand.